Uh, hello and welcome to the lecture on nationalism and sexualism in the period after the War of 1812, also known as the uh, Era of Good Feelings. And we've got sort of the old generation on the way out, uh, you know, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. We get a new generation coming in, he Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson, both from the West, John Q. Adams, son of, of John Adams, Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, and John C. Calhoun as well. And uh, a much more power for the Senate. Uh, during this time and not so much as the presidency. And these new generation that's coming in, they're much more um, looking at the nation of, as a whole. They're not as, uh, as identifying as much with their individual state or region like somebody like Jefferson was. They're, they're thinking more in, in terms of the nation. But this is a time of the regions really becoming differentiated economically. And we've got three regions. We've got the, the old Northeast up here, uh, New England and New York and Pennsylvania, that's going to see the rise of industry and manufacturing as the Industrial Revolution uh, early on begins, and commerce as well. The South, cotton's going to take off during this time, and the expansion of slavery as well, and that's going to, of course, be a major issue moving forward. And this new territory of the West once native resistance is really broken and there's a lot of sort of push and pull sort of happening that's attracting uh, settlers into this region uh, along the Ohio River and into the Great Lakes area. Now we've got then a proposal, an economic proposal put forward by, uh, by Henry Clay known as the American system where he wants to tie together these three regions. And his proposal, which is going to look very similar to uh, and Alexander Hamilton's program, calls for a tariff, a protective tariff, a tax on manufactured goods being imported into the country to protect American industry so that they don't need to compete with uh, British uh, manufacturing. Uh, a much stable banking system and uh, renewing the national bank as a way to encourage investment and internal improvements and this is sort of a new thing. So the protective tariff, they're concerned about British dumping because of the War of 1812, their warehouses, the in inventory of, of British businesses was, was overflowing and they just want to dump their products at a cheap price so the tariff is to prevent that from happening. The banking system to encourage commerce and manufacturing and the internal improvements this is especially designed, uh, when we see internal improvements, infrastructure is what we mean, to qualitatively improve the nation and improve the transportation of the nation and make it so that Western farmers can have a, a larger market. Cause, because at the time, uh, transportation was extremely difficult in the United States. Uh, roads were really terrible. There are no railroads as yet. And the only way is through, uh, is through water, the rivers. And it's, uh, the idea here is to connect especially the west to the northeast through canals and roads. It's vetoed by President Madison, saying this is not the responsibility of the national government. And really the opposition to this comes from the south because they see if you can accept in the idea of the national government taking over this responsibility, then it's not too far removed from the idea that the national government can step in on a labor issue, uh, i.e. slavery. So uh, they're, they're opposed to this idea. So it's, it's a proposal. Now the bank goes through, the tariff goes through, and, but the biggest losers to this is the South. Uh, with the protective tariff is going to make manufactured goods which they which they buy more expensive for them so it's going to create tension between the three regions so the idea here is to tie the nation together but the reality is is that it it um, widens and reveals fault lines between the three regions but it is the time known as the good feelings and the nationalism definitely this time and the feeling of pride, but not so good feelings, this idea of sectionalism coming through. And where is the supremacy? Is it in the states as individual states or is it the national government? And slavery is really going to start to put a wedge in there. So these fault lines, these cracks in the nation are starting to be exposed 
during this time. Now, one of the other things that comes out during this time is really the first sort of economic uh, collapse. And I want to look at uh, economics over time and this idea of economic production. So let's say we've got here, we've got the economy going up, improving, and then we're going to have a panic. As the economy dips down, and then we'll go back up, and then back down, and then back up down and so on. What we have here is the cyclical nature of economics where uh, it, it's going up but then it's sort of getting too hot as people are investing too much. It looks like you know there's easy uh, easy money to be made and then the markets will sort of correct themselves and you'll get a crash. And you know what happened here? 1819 going to happen here in 1837 and it's going to happen here in the late 50s about every 20 years very sort of predictable but what we do have over over the long run is sustained growth happening as uh, as economic production does increase now what's leading to these sort of panics or or recessions these dips in the economy well, Western expansion really played a large role to this, and it was in the West that much of this panic occurred. So, West, uh, it's growing, and why? You know, end of native resistance, immigrants are starting to come in, there's cheap land to be out there, there are improvements being done to the transportation at the state level mostly, uh, but then we're getting these sort of economic problems as, uh, you know, they're growing kind of too fast, these things. Uh, here's the famous Cumberland Gap that uh, it's, it's a gap through the Appalachian Mountains. It's a gap created when an asteroid hit the mountains uh, millions of years ago. Uh, the uh, Appalachian Mountains are very old mountains. And they're streaming through there and going along this line is this was a, a road that was constructed and we can see a uh, very sustained sort of organized settlement along this road and also down the Ohio River as well. And there's a road being created. You might get inns along the way, and along the inns, markets might spring up. Now, while that expansion is happening, we've got other expansion happening down in the south. What's known as the peculiar institution, and by that they mean slavery. And since 1776, when they declared independence, slavery was legal everywhere, but that's changed a lot. Britain's banned it and they're suppressing the international slave trade and through moral reasons you know the people of England are really calling for this the United States did not allow slavery to be imported in they could be smuggled in northern states have all uh, emancipated their slaves by this line uh, by this time and the countries of Latin America uh, South America and Mexico have banned slavery and in the north, there's a small group uh, that's going to get bigger and bigger over time and louder and louder, uh, calling for an end to slavery on moral or economic grounds, known as the abolitionists. But it's expanding, and it's expanding rapidly during this time. This is showing African-American population. And slavery, at its heart, it's violence. It's, a, it's an inherently violent uh, labor system. The motivation is through violence. And what's leading it, of course, is the cotton industry. And slavery really took off with the invention of the cotton gin. A very simple invention. You pour the cotton in, you turn a handle, teeth within the, the engine uh, grind up the cotton, and the seeds just fall out of the, uh, uh, from within. Before this, cotton was not really economically viable because it just was took too much labor to pull the seeds out uh, before you could use them. Uh, but this simple invention changes all that. And cotton becomes king. They called it king cotton. And lots of profits be made from it. High demand in England for it and then later in, in the northeast United States. And these two graphs showing side by side cotton production and slave production and is showing there thousands of bales. This is a bale of cotton, so you can see 500,000, uh, a million, up to four million 
by the time of the Civil War. Four million of these being done a year. Lots of money. But this is going to lead to a growing slave population. So this is showing in 1820 where there are slaves, with each dot representing 200 slaves. And we can see there are still some up here in New York on the Hudson River, uh, but not a lot. This is the Chesapeake. This is our tobacco. Down here, this is the uh, rice growing region of the Carolinas. And, uh, you know, a few pockets out here but, uh, of cotton. But we can see by 1860, boom, as the cotton belt really takes off down here. And this is a lot more, not tobacco necessarily, but more of cotton as well. So a big, a big increase in the number of slaves. Now the South slave owners, which we're going to start calling the slaveocracy, the slave power, from their point of view, slavery is, is necessary and is uh, beneficial for the whole country. They would criticize their Northerners as being hypocrites. They would say, look at your own you know, wage earners in the factories who, you know, you don't treat them very well either, and arguing that the country should expand. But really what it is, is they're, they're fearing uh, that the North is going to subdue them in terms of power and that they're going to use this influence as they grow in population to ban slavery and that, uh, or that northern extremists will, will help to facilitate slave uprisings. That's their biggest fear, is the slaves coming in you know, and taking off their head. And as they expand, we're going to get the issue of can we allow slavery? And it's going to come to a, a, a head in Missouri, when Missouri applies to join the country and uh, the dis do not allow slavery to expand. But the slave owners in the South, you know, here they're fearing a balance, uh, a, a shift in the balance of power, and they, they don't like this precedent of slavery being banned in this new state, because of course they want to allow slavery to, uh, to be a viable labor system in southern cotton growing states. So a compromise is made that uh, Missouri can come in as a slave state. In addition, uh, at the same time, Maine will break off from Massachusetts and join as a free state and will have a balance in the Senate between slave states and free states. But they draw a line and say uh, from 36 degrees north, we will not allow slavery in the future. And so if we look at the map, that line is right here. There's the line. So all this area up here of b the previous Louisiana purchase, according to this agreement, it's going to come in as free states, slavery not allowed. And it doesn't leave a lot of room for future slave states, only in this Arkansas territory as there. So that's the deal that's been made. Now, they haven't solved anything. They've really just kicked the can down the road for another generation to figure out, which had been done before, the three-fifths compromise. Uh, you know, we'll just knock it down the road. And now we've got the Missouri Compromise. And it's not the last of the compromises. And at some point, the compromise is no longer going to be a viable option. So this is a cancer in the nation. All right. That concludes this sort of lecture on nationalism and sectionalism. And we can see, you know, these two sections, uh, particularly north and south, wedges being, being struck into them. All right, thank you.